Welcome to ASRM Today, a podcast that takes a deeper dive into the current topics in reproductive medicine. I am Jeffrey Hayes. Today on the show, we're talking about resident education in REI. Joining me to discuss this is Dr. Molly Quinn, who is in obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility with Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center and UCLA Santa Monica Medical Center. Welcome, Molly. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Also with us is Dr. Kathleen Devine, Director of Research, Obstetrics and Gynecology, Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility with Shady Grove Fertility in Washington, D.C., and is also an Assistant Professor at Georgetown University and is on the faculty for the NIH in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Welcome, Kathleen. Thanks so much for having me. I want to start by asking both of you, if you if if you could, could you tell our listeners a little bit about how you're affiliated with SREI? I am the chair of the Resident and Medical Student Education Committee, and we've got a group of six of us who've been really interested in this topic and have worked to create materials for resident and medical student trainees as it relates to reproductive endocrinology and infertility. And I'm the chair of the SREI Research Committee do a lot of research myself, which the fellows and residents who are trainees with us at SG Fertility and NIH in Georgetown contribute greatly to. And we also, as a research committee, um, review a lot of surveys that uh, residents uh, contribute to sending out to the SREI membership to publish research upon those data. Dr. Quinn, how long has SREI had an online presence in education? Ooh. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I would say that we've had a, a trainee landing page for a while. Uh, I think it's only recently that we've developed some materials that actually are housed there. They were published just a couple months ago. And as far as I'm aware, that is the first time we've had materials available for trainees to learn about reproductive endocrinology. Dr. Devine, does any of the survey work, does that help inform what type of educational materials are going to be developed? Uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, the surveys that are submitted to the research committee to go out to SREI members are really driven by those who have those interests in that particular sphere of research. So occasionally there will be surveys submitted that have to do with, you know, education and REI, but they really cover a broad range of topics. Molly, I want to circle back now. You've helped to develop a number of of the resident educational resources on the SREI website. Can you tell me just a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think there was an acknowledgement that trainees are often left to their own devices with respect to gaining knowledge outside of the day-to-day curriculum from seeing patients. We wanted to develop a more formalized structure for trainees and also to help busy clinicians who are supervising trainees to point their residents and medical students in in the direction of of modules that they could use, reading reference materials that they could use. So we have uh, three separate documents that we've recently developed. The first is a a rotation curriculum, and it's just an example of taking a a trainee resident, for example, through kind of week by week of what might be important subject areas within the REI field to focus on with associated guided reading. There's also a more general reading curriculum divided by topic matter for perhaps reference if a resident is going to see a patient with a specific issue, they might be able to read up in advance, uh, knowing that the basic literature that exists, they might be able to gain more out of that clinical interaction. And then finally, understanding that one of the goals of the REI resident rotation is not only to gain exposure in the field to perhaps generate interest, but also to prepare residents for their CREOG examinations, their annual examinations to develop, to demonstrate the learning that they have achieved that year. And so we have a CREOG review PowerPoint that is pretty robust, over 100 slides, to try to take these trainees through the subject matter in in an efficient and effective way. And I should say that there is a all represents the work, not of myself, but of uh, the folks on our committee who have worked really hard to develop these materials and have also been able to get a lot of external input, including those of trainees. 
And I know from the ASRM standpoint that we've we've reached out and we've worked now over the years. Uh, we developed a grand round series that we mm-hmm. uh, did for a couple of years, and you know, I used to get phone calls <laughs> all the time from uh, fellowship directors <laughs> who were just like, "How do I get this? How do I get done? The, you know, I got to get my residents on here." And, you know, and we set up a whole program. Are these types of video lectures sort of common as part of your educational materials? They've been so helpful, actually. Those have been guided, I think, towards more the fellowship, but I think also some resident trainees as well. And ideally, we'd like to branch into more subtopic matter videos that might be helpful to residents and medical students. I think they're extremely helpful. You can get so much through interactions with patients, but you can get much more, I think, when you're prepared with the basic physiology and knowledge base. I'm speaking today with Dr. Molly Quinn and Dr. Kathleen Devine about resident education in REI. I'll pose this next question for both of you. What are some of the major challenges of resident education in REI? You know, I think recently in the realm of of COVID, there have been more challenges, especially in the setting where um, I teach residents, which is in the clinic in a a private practice based setting, where a lot of our consults have during COVID and starting to change now, but have been done virtually. And so being able to kind of give them the, you know, the hands-on and in-person experience uh, that is helpful in, in, you know, training one's knowledge in a clinical setting has been a challenge. And I think we're also happy in that hopefully we're coming out of that stage. And the materials, I can attest myself that, that Molly and her committee have developed in terms of directing our learners towards topics that are relevant, you know, and tested and relevant for their long-term practice, whether that be as a general gynecologist or as a reproductive endocrinologist have been just so helpful in addressing that particular challenge. So we, we shouldn't be worried then that, that, you know, there'll be no more hands-on, right? Like the, <laughs> it will circle back, right? Like well, doctors, doctors have to put their hands on patients, you know, one way or another. Um, that said, in an REI setting, a lot of the ways in which we're able to teach residents are in, uh, you know, by having them observe a consultation and then to unpack with them after the consultation, all of the issues that were covered with that patient. Um, And it just doesn't necessarily have the same zing when it's via telemedicine. Sometimes yes, but oftentimes no. And so we're lucky to have these other resources to review with them during the time that we share. I'll say that one of the other challenges with resident education is that residents have a lot of competing responsibilities. And in the REI space, a lot of times it's seen as an opportunity for learning, um, but there isn't the same kind of requirement for staffing, for example, that you need to operate a labor and delivery 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so when there is an issue with coverage in a resident program, oftentimes we find that it is the REI resident who gets sacrificed to provide the service wherever they may be needed. So I think one of the challenges that we've had as a field is allowing our trainees to get the exposure to what we do in a consistent and meaningful way. And I think that we are working on ways to to try to formalize that and to make sure that we're getting our residents for their due time so that they really do get the experience they'll need either as a generalist or to generate the interest in becoming a subspecialist within REI. But I, I do think these reading materials are helpful because if the need is to be seeing patients clinically elsewhere, the same material could be assigned and patients could be, I mean, sorry, <laughs> residents, trainees will still be responsible for the knowledge base, but really it, nothing can replace the, the clinical interaction. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Molly. I think that, um, you know, uh, there's a huge range in terms of the interest level among residents in, in wanting to prioritize learning an REI, and that's totally appropriate based on their career goals. That said, especially for those who want to get more exposure to this and want to perhaps apply for fellowship in REI, it can be very disappointing when um, a large percentage of that experience winds up getting stripped away because of of coverage needs. It's a a real challenge. So we know that the SREI website is sort of the the go-to here. And of course, we're going to put the website link in our show notes so that people can just 
go right to it and instantly access to see some more about this of, of what we're discussing. My question for both of you is, what other resources would you recommend at this time? I think ASRM has great resources, and we've been working together to try to identify needs. So we've done a needs assessment together, ASRM and SREI, from both residents and the residency program directors so that we can understand how we can better serve. And so I think there will be more to come. Um, But the SRM website can also be a good source of information. Of course, you you discussed the grand rounds. There There are hours worth of videos that residents can access through the ASRM website. As residents, my understanding is that they do have access to that and are able to do so throughout their curriculum or throughout their time in residency. So I always encourage residents to go to those grand rounds um, to read the practice committee documents that are available from ASRM to gain a basic understanding and also have the references to read where those recommendations do come from. I think that's helpful as well. The committee opinions, I think, could be useful for residents as well. I agree. And, you know, not to hasten back to the SREI resources. That said, there are a lot of not just the slides and so on, but there is a list of primary resources that are recommended for resident REI learners right there. And so it's a it's a sort of pared down specific list. And of course, there are also the ACOG and ABOG resources to help prepare for the CREOGs and the board examinations that have specific Uh, recommendations for those preparations in REI specifically. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you both today. This is this is really important. And believe it or not, ASRM gets so many questions about this, you know, every year. I hope we can have you back soon, if possible, so we can continue this discussion and sort of broaden it a little bit more. Would love to. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it so much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Please subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, and this is ASRM Today. This concludes this episode of ASRM Today. For show notes, author information, and discussions, go to asrmtoday.org. This material is copyrighted by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and may not be reproduced or used without express consent from ASRM. ASRM Today Series podcasts are supported in part by the ASRM Corporate Member Council. The information and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of ASRM and its affiliates. These are provided as a source of general information and are not a substitute for consultation with a physician.